So welcome everyone. Um, James and I are excited to, to talk CDP today. Really the topic today is, you know, how do you prepare your data for a composable CDP architecture? Uh, we'll get a bit into the weeds in terms of the, the process that that goes through, um, uh, things around identity, things around actually the, the how to manipulate the data. Um, and we'll also talk a little about, about the CDP um, marketplace and, and, and space in, in general. So why don't we get rolling? And just for a quick agenda, set some expectations. Uh, James and I will do some intros. We'll talk about CDPs today, the different flavors of CDPs that are available. James will really deep dive into how you can help prepare your data for a CDP implementation. Um, I can walk through just a handful of steps in the Simon platform to give some folks um, just some context of how Simon functions. Um, and then hopefully with the with the large group that we have, we'll have a handful of questions um, and we should be out of here in you know, 30, 35 minutes. Perfect. So before we get too far, James, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, then I'll introduce myself. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm James Colvin. I'm the Director of Data Engineering uh, at Brooklyn Data Cove. Uh, I think we have intros to our companies on the next slide, um, so I don't want to spoil too much. I'll go ahead and pass it over to you, Matt. Yep. Uh, so my name is Matt O'Neill. Um, I'm the Director of Sales Engineering at Simon Data. I just realized that my name is misspelled in the slide, so that's a slow start for me. Um, so uh, so I basically, uh, I run a solutions team that focuses on anything technical, how the product works, integrations, spend a lot of time focusing on how we can get data ready to be usable for marketers or actionable for marketers in the CDP. Um, I've been with Simon for just about two and a half years, spent about seven years at Salesforce prior to this. So been in the CDP and the marketing space for uh, what feels like a long time. Um, and we'll be talking a lot about that as we move forward. So uh, just quickly, if you want James talk about Brooklyn Data Co. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Brooklyn Data, we're a uh, full service data and analytics consultancy. So data engineering, like the function I lead, as well as analytics engineering, uh, data analytics with BI and you know everything that surrounds all of that, all the different layers of the modern data stack. We help organizations build their data capabilities across people, processes, and, and technology. Awesome. Yeah. Matt, and you want to talk about Simon? Yeah, absolutely. So, so Simon Data is really one of the the, the most connected customer data platforms uh, available on the market today. Um, we obviously have a, a, a very important partnership with Snowflake, but work with a, a lot of different data warehouses. And really the goal of Simon is to make marketing data actionable. When I say marketing data actionable, think segmentation, automation, experimentation, and personalization. I think one of the fundamental challenges that we'll talk about today is that marketers they don't have direct access to their data and that in and of itself is a challenge when trying to create personalized experiences, whether it's over email, SMS, push the website, direct mail, et cetera. Cool. So we'll start off um, with some jokes. We brought jokes, James and I, which is great. And I think everyone has, <laughs> has uh, essentially had this experience, right? Where you're being marketed to, maybe you made a purchase. This happened to me very recently, um, training for a race and I bought a pair of sneakers and I literally got an ad for those sneakers that I had just purchased 10 minutes after I purchased the sneakers for cheaper. So it, what the marketer's goal is really to provide as much context at every touch point throughout the life cycle to make sure that that, that uh, messaging is consistent and that experience is consistent. I think everyone has had a challenging experience with a marketing company where whether you have an open support case or you you have a bit, you know, a shipping delay or something along those lines, and you're getting incentive messages to buy things. It's like, no, I'm upset right now. I'm not going to purchase anything. Or the inverse of that is obviously, you know, you make a purchase or you're somewhere in the life cycle and you get messages that just contradicts the other experience you just had on the app or on the web. So a, a huge component of what we're going to talk about today is how we can enable marketers to not have experiences like this and make sure that the experience is, is contextual using all available data across all available touch points. Now, I think right. one of the major challenges that, that customers have is, or, or that, are, that are not using effectively using their, their data warehouse is they struggle to truly get a 360 view of that customer, right? There's data in multiple applications. Um, there's there's fast moving data, website data, app data, SMS, email engagement data that's moving at slower speed or faster speeds than profile based data. They have a difficult time marrying those things. If you're using multiple tools for email or SMS or the website, 
making sure that all of these tools are connected uh, with whether it's API or batch ingestion processes, like it just creates an environment where everything is siloed, where it's very difficult to manage and marketers are essentially struggling to make sure that, that the experience traded is consistent. So really mm -hmm. connecting your data warehouse to your CDP and ultimately to your engagement components, emails, uh, SMS push messaging is really designed to give marketer the ability to create those really consistent experiences. Anything to add, James? Yeah, yeah. I just want to add. I think you know it's pretty well recognized now. Like that cloud data warehouse really is like you have your the nucleus of like a company's modern data architecture now, right? Like all of those different data points and things that matches went through you typically end up in your, or they should be ending up in your cloud data warehouse. So all of that data is there. It offers you a lot of great scalability, speed, accessibility, security around all of that data. And so why try and, you know, duplicate that in a parallel system, you know, you know let your CDP hook into it and better utilize your data warehouse and all the functionality and, uh, it can leverage and provide. Yep, exactly right. And especially, you know, working with, with the Brooklyn Data Co folks with Simon, we have seen an explosion of folks taking their data warehouse data and starting to ingest more marketing engagement centric data sets for marketers to leverage, right? I think in the past, a lot of the engagement data has been housed in the ESP, in the in the the the, the braises, the intervals, the engagement platforms of the world, the Salesforce marketing clouds, and now we're we're seeing more consistently engagement and marketing centric attributes flowing into Snowflake, flowing into your data warehouses, where marketers now have even a greater need to have access to the data warehouse to drive experiences. So it is only heading more and more in that direction, um, and that's essentially you know one of the main topics of of today's conversation. So. Just for a little bit of background, and there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of confusion in the CDP space. <laughs> in the last few years, there has certainly been an entire new you know, dictionary and nomenclature of what is what and how these things are uh, broken apart and what is a CDP versus an engagement platform versus a, a DMP, right? So I, I just wanted to take a minute to kind of talk through some common terms, how these things are deployed and essentially what they're used for. So First and foremost are essentially your package CDPs. Now, when I think package CDPs, I think of like the big box Salesforce, the Adobe's of the world, where essentially their CDP offering is really designed to create a single view of the customer across all of their other proper applications. Think of like a marketing cloud, a service cloud, a sales cloud, a community cloud, and, and leverage all those same logos and build a consistent view or a single viewer customer. That is generally what you'll hear with, you know, package CDPs. Their goal is essentially to you, for, to, for, for you to use their products in one singleized platform. I think, like I said, Salesforce and Adobe are a perfect example of that. Um, on the, uh, the other end of the spectrum, at least in this slide, are your composable CDPs. And, you know, James is going to talk a little bit about this as we move forward. Also, here is where marketers have the ability to essentially choose their engagement stack. They might be using Braze for, e for email. They might be, or, or responses for email. Maybe they're using Twilio or, or Interval for SMS or, or push messaging. So essentially it is designed for you to choose your engagement channels and then also choose where your data lives. So that might be in, like I said, Snowflake, which is a, you know obviously a huge preference for Simon or an Azure data warehouse or, or AWS Redshift or a variety of places. So in that case, the composable CDP architecture is basically designed for marketers and the IT team to choose which applications they wanna work. Now, inherently, there is some data replication that is happening in deployments like this, right? Generally speaking, these tools are taking data out of the data warehouse, storing them in a local store of the CDP, and then passing that to engagement channels for personalization. Anything to add on, on that one, James? Yeah, I just yeah, I wanna call out like that, that last point we have done there, like, yeah, it's really great. Yeah, you get to build it yourself. You connect all the pieces together. You you know, like it says, you compose it all together. But then that does require a lot of overhead and maintenance to make sure all those pieces continue to fit together, talk to one another. The data is you know is uh, behaving properly as it goes through each of those different steps. So yeah, there there definitely is like a downside to that you know, that benefit of being able to choose every single individual piece. Exactly right, and and a lot of customers that choose a composable stack are somewhere in their 
early in their data warehouse adoption. Maybe the data warehouse mm -hmm. doesn't have you know, all of the data just yet, or there's some some rudimentary profile information for marketers, but they're still like pretty early days in terms of their data warehouse adoption. Yeah. Perfect. And then the last one, and I think, you know, Simon, you know, fits in this bucket is really around connected CDPs, where this is literally saying we are deploying the CDP on top of your data warehouse. So think in, in terms of Simon data sitting on top of Snowflake, Snowflake is your data warehouse. We are essentially providing the ability to do segmentation, automation, and personalization with the data consistently sitting in that data warehouse. So there's no data replication in this in this case. We are literally looking at the tables that are exposed to us. And in that case, we can grab that information. Marketers can directly query the data warehouse through a user-friendly UI, which I'll show toward, at, towards the end of this demonstration, and then activate that data to preferred channels. So a lot of folks that are that are choosing to go with this the connected CDP route have a pretty mature data warehouse, right? There's still things that are coming in, but they've essentially decided, hey, we're centralizing on Snowflake, right? And because of that, we want to make sure that any data element that flows into Snowflake is then immediately available for marketers to take action on. Yep. Cool. Cool. So let's jump back over yeah. to a few more of the content. I think James, here's where we'll get into, you know, a few of the components around how to really get your data in, in a mature state for whether it's composable architecture or a connected architecture. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so kind of three high level steps. I'm gonna go a little bit deeper into each one of these as we go. So you're kind of doing a survey of your data to like ensure and kind of set a benchmark of how you wanna treat your data accuracy what steps you need to do to you know, maintain that data accuracy, and then also a little bit on you know compliance, right? Like it's on on top of everyone's minds. Like there's all these other like data privacy regulations that you want to make sure that you stay compliant on, especially like with a CDP offering sitting on top. You don't want you know personal data leaking out to to folks who shouldn't have access to it, right? So um, yeah, if we want to dive right in, so ensuring data accuracy, right? So you garbage in, garbage out, right? Is like the too long didn't read of, read of this, right? So Simon can't be of value to you if the data that's sitting inside your snowflake is, is not clean and accurate to give you a good picture of who your customer is, right? So first off, kind of like very first step, look at all those different data sources like the Matt was mentioning, like whatever different tools you're using, your Shopify, your Salesforce, Braze, et cetera, whichever one has the, the largest wealth of cus of your customer information at what you feel is like the highest or most uh, maintained, right? Like best accuracy just from baseline. Probably not perfect. Nobody's is perfect, right? Don't don't beat yourself up too much on that. But just figure out like which one is the best data set I have to kind of start with and be that foundational layer that we can then build and integrate on top of. Um, yeah, and I think this on. specifically is is really important. I think we spend a lot of time talking about what is your stable identifier? How can you tell who Matt O'Neill is in your Shopify, in your data warehouse, in your e-commerce tool, in your ESP, right? And, mm -hmm. and getting this right really helps you with a lot of the things that James will talk about moving forward. So I think, yeah. and also, and we see it all the time, and that's one of the reasons Brooklyn Data Co. is, is such a great partner of us is a lot of our customers come to us and they essentially have data spaghetti. And it's like, what should our strategy even be here, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and this is certainly an area that Simon can help you with. And it's certainly an area that, that Brooklyn Data Co. leans in pretty heavily with. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I love that phrase, stable identifier. Yeah, so once you look at that stable identifier, there's some questions you want to ask just to be aware of like, what's the level of effort for us to kind of work with this data set and, and ensure it's accurate and build on top of it. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, Matt, uh, we have some of those here. So first question, pretty obvious, like what, what source system is that stable identifier? Is it our Shopify or Salesforce, et cetera? How is that data collected? Is it coming from web events? Is it user provided? Are they like physically entering it into a form? Is it, one of your employees entering it on behalf of the user, et cetera. Like, um, obviously, how often is it collected? Are we waiting a week, a day? Is it real time or near real time? And then, how is the data updated? Like, this is can, can be kind of a really big gotcha for folks. Is when this data from this source system hits inside your snowflake, how is that 
how is new data or updated data treated? Is it overwriting the old data? Is it adding a new row? Does it update the old row and say, hey, this one's this one's old now, use this one, right? Like understanding how that source data is landing inside your Snowflake environment is, is really key to ensure you're keeping track of history and who the, the most current version of your customer is. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then, no, go ahead. Matt. Say the, the, the latency of this is super important. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people think data warehouse means slow to some extent in terms mm -hmm. of profile data are coming in, you know, slowly, or there's machine learning that's being calculated every 24 hours, right? And, and I think, you know, the way that Simon is implemented and the way that, uh, you know, we work with you folks, a lot of this is focused on engagement data, which is fast moving data. That is website yep. visits, that's app engagement, that's email clicks and opens. So a huge component of the conversation we like to have is what data sets are, do you have? What is the latency around these data sets and how should we, we react? Right. Because as like we said, the you know, the 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 cartoon we had is around you know, right message at the right time. And the right time often means measured in minutes or hours versus 24 hour batch type increments. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and all the modern data warehouses, Snowflake is really great about this, do offer like streaming or near real time ingestion capabilities so that you like you said, you're not waiting for a daily batch job. You you can get that event streaming data in there, you know, almost as fast as it happens. Yep, exactly uh, right. And, and I think one last thing with, with data sets for, before we move on is if you have data that is important, transaction information, what what data sets can we derivate from those? Can we create mm -hmm. lifetime values? Can we create average transaction values? Can we can we, you know, do calculations of like churn or purchase propensity? So it's not even what data sets do you have. It's like, what data elements do you have that could also be provide richer insights that just need to be transformed, but the data exists in, in general? Yeah, yeah. You can almost uh, extend this last question here, not just like, how are you using this data now? But like, how do you want to use this data in the future if we could really, you know, leverage it better? Yep, exactly right. Um, yeah. And so, you know, asking all those questions, really getting a feel for for this stable identifier, this golden record, you know, can help you determine like what are the thresholds for quality that we want our other data sets that we want to layer on top of this one to meet. So are there's and and start making those and these are business decisions. There's no right answer, like global right answer. It's gonna depend on your business, your you and how you want to use this data. So making the decisions on Okay, well, if this other data set is below the thresholds that we're discussing, do we just throw out that column or do we want to do some sort of data transformation on top of it? Like, you know, we have the example here. If we have a value that's missing for a lot of entry entries, do we just want to not include that value at all? Or do we want to do some something like, okay, well, let's take the average of all the ones that do have a value and that's what we'll plug in for a missing value. Yep, exactly. And it, it's interesting because, look, marketing data inherently is going to be messy. And when I say yep. marketing data inherently is going to be messy, you know, especially ESP type information, you know, you have 10 Mickey Mouses in your list or, or I would say like right. I'm a Giants fan and Eli Manning, right? So, mm -hmm. so point being is some of that metadata doesn't have first names. Some of that metadata doesn't have, you know, uh, information that is pertinent for personalization. So like you mentioned, we can set up rule sets yep. to define that. We also specifically at Simon validate data as it comes in. We're checking for null values. We're checking for dates to make sure that they're, you know, ascending versus descending. You know, we're doing um, mm -hmm. any sort of validation to make sure that when it hits the level for audience segmentation or personalization, the data is in a mature enough state. And like some of that, like you said, you know, uh, you know, James and team can check in, in Snowflake and build guardrails there, but certainly Simon is very cognizant of this when it hits the area for actual activation. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so great. Now we have our stable identifier. We know what source system we want to use to build on top of. Oh, we also need to make sure we have a data stack that's ready to take in all this data and for Simon to sit on top of, right? So obviously uh, we need to get move the data somehow. Uh, five trains the market leader here, really great at data movement. There's also uh, open source framework. So if you are in an industry or at a company who 
very much prefers everything to be like inside your own virtual private cloud. You can use some of these frameworks like Airbyte or Meltano to deployed inside your private cloud. Fivetrain also has offerings around that um, as well. Cloud data warehouses, we've already mentioned, I don't know, maybe 50 times already. Uh, Snowflake is really our preferred solution here. Just a ton of a ton of powerful capabilities, but still really easy to use. Um, and then transformations. So we get the raw data in there. You don't want to just deal with all this raw data. You want to transform it, do these data quality transformations, you know, convert into a solid like user table as opposed to user tables coming from five different source systems of marketing platforms you use. And there's a lot of great transformation frameworks. DBT is by far the market leader, but this is a pretty new space. Um, there's other new entrants coming up all the time. Uh, we mentioned a couple new ones here. And then like uh, Snowflake's putting some more capabilities in there. Like they just introduced a function called dynamic tables. It's really exciting and interesting. They can help keep those transformations and do it again, like in near real time. You don't have to wait for like, Oh yeah, my Salesforce data lane, but now I have to wait for the, the transformation job to run. You know, like all these things can happen very, very quickly. Yeah, exactly. And, and Simon, in a lot of cases, does last mile transformation for folks before a marketer has access to it. I think one of the most common things we see is the data in the data warehouse, the schema and the naming conventions don't align with what a marketer or someone that's driving engagement would understand, right? So a lot of times it's making those fields just more readable or more understandable for a user that doesn't live in Snowflake every day or doesn't live in, in a data warehouse every day. So certainly, you know, we lean into that challenge also because we want to make sure, hey, having all of the data, data warehouse is great, but if you don't understand what it actually is designed for, it's certainly not going to get us anywhere. So yeah, I think the transformation piece of this is certainly an important, important piece because yeah, a data warehouse is not necessarily designed to use marketing nomenclature on table names. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yep. So that's step one. Uh, so step two, like we figured out our data accuracy goals, everything like that. We're getting all the raw data in our warehouse. Okay, how do we make sure we maintain it? So step one, let's refer back to all those quality metrics that you discussed and decided on as a business in step one. And so the point here is to make some of these questions really easy to answer. So if your Salesforce says a customer is 36 year old, years old, but they just put in a web form on your website that they're 38, which do you trust, right? Like that should be an easy answer to give based on the discussions and quality metrics you decided in step one, right? Ideally, you can have a single stable identifier for like all these things and you can just say, we always trust Salesforce for age. Real world's never as nice as we want it. So you, it's, this is probably gonna end up being some business logic. Again, trans, those transformation frameworks can help you there okay, well, if they fill out the web form, we want that, we want to take that age over the Salesforce, but if they don't have the web form, we'll take Salesforce. But if they do this thing over here, we'll take that, you know, and Simon and these other tools in your data stack help like maintain all of that business logic as long as you've already like decided it up front. Yep, exactly. I think, I mean, if the age is 36 and 38, I would always go with the younger one. That is me personally, just because I'm getting older. Um, but but certainly the the idea that hey we're all pointing at a customer's table we know if we need to resolve conflict this is where we're headed right and as a business we decide on that that certainly helps a lot of the because there's inevitably inevitably going to be conflict right especially with that we did like and people are exactly. typing like it's that is part of the gig so certainly having those rules set up front. It's even with identity, right? Making sure that you're yeah. merging identities. Another thing that, that that is foundationally set up that will then save you a lot of time moving forward. Yep, great, uh, great cue for the for the next slide. So that's exactly one of the things we're talking about is you know cleaning your data, right? So identities being a big one of these with the data deduplication, right? You'll have a Matt O'Neill in your Braze, you'll have a Matt O'Neill in your Salesforce. How do we make sure we know that those are the same Matt O'Neill's, right? So combining and compressing records across all these different data sets um, and also doing like just standardizing, right? So maybe you'll, you'll see weird stuff in data, right? Like, like Matt said, it's, it's messy, especially marking data by design. So like, I don't know, one data set might call it first name and another data set might call it just F name, right? 
So just standardizing on naming for all of these different fields or making sure that the data types are the same. Do, are, are some of these data, data coming in as strings when they really need to be numbers or, or dates or things? Um, and also normalizing on units. This is a big one that can trip a lot of folks up, right? You're getting a bunch of currency information from these systems. Is it all in US dollars? Is some of it coming in euros, British pounds? You, do you need to do some sort of currency conversion or at least acknowledge that the units of currency are different in the data? Time zones are also a big one that can trip you up. Like, yeah. Is everything coming in in UTC? Does your business operate on Eastern time? And so we need to work on like converting these time, all this time data to Eastern time so it makes sense for your business. And when you're measuring like daily users, it's a day as your business understands it and not a day as the computer understands it. So all of these different things, again, you know, these tools we're talking about, Simon, especially help help standardize and, yeah, and, and maintain for you. And a lot of this, like especially the du duplication piece, can be a real challenge, right? If oh, I yeah. put if mm -hmm. I put Matt O'Neill as my name somewhere and then I put Matthew O'Neill as my name as somewhere else, right? Is this the same person? And I think there has to be decisions, like business decisions made to say, you know, we're going to deterministically match on this value, right? If we need to do some form of, you know, fuzzy matching or things like that, we got to do that well upstream of the CDP because the CDP is yep. essentially the tool that's driving communications. And the last thing we want to do is be doing sort of like last mile component and like merging when we're not in, uh, explicitly sure it's the right person, right? Yep. So major mm -hmm. challenge that a lot, especially like you said, marketing data is going to be dirty inherently. Yeah. Yeah. No, 100%. All these things I said are way easier said than done, especially data du deduplication. Yeah, you know, there's companies and tools that specialize just on deduplication because it is a hairy problem to solve for sure. Yep. And coming yeah. from Salesforce, certainly um, anyone that's used Salesforce or a CRM knows um, inherently sales folks put a lot of information in there or service folks that doesn't always match. <laughs> so that can be a challenge <laughs> yeah. for sure. Yep. Yeah, so now that we have all of these standardized, clean data sets, it's now much easier to join all of it together in your in your CDP, right? So now you have a, a clean, cohesive customer record, sales records, et cetera, et cetera. And it's easy now to join all of that together. And so you can get that through line in your CDP of, oh, okay, Matt O'Neill opened this email and then he bought a thing. And then he went and read this blog post and he, and he shared it or, you know, all that customer user journey stuff is now much easier to see because you've got this very good base of data quality. Yep, exactly. And this is where a lot of that experience uh, metadata is so important. Matt saw mm -hmm. this on the site. Matt downloaded the app. Matt redeemed his loyalty points. Matt has a customer service case, right? Matt, Matt signed up for the webinar, but missed the webinar, right? All of those components, please don't miss the webinar, everyone. Thank you for coming. But I'm just saying in terms of like the events that are happening, tying that to Matt, a 40-year-old man in Massachusetts, three kids, right? That is where the power comes. I'll show some of this as we get deeper into the, 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 the demonstration in terms of like how to drive segmentation. But that event data is so important for a lot of use cases. Um, and like we said, mm -hmm. it's coming in fast. Cool. Oops. That's right. Yeah. So step three, you know, yes, we have all this great data that we've cleaned and trying to maintain data quality on now, but we still need to keep in mind, like I said earlier, privacy, especially around all these different regulations such as GDPR, et cetera. So even if you're not in a heavily regulated industry, like, you know, just morally speaking, we should be good stewards of our customers' data, right? We don't want to just share their private information indiscriminately. Um, so your cloud data warehouses against Snowflake is makes uh, has a lot of different tools to help you with this. Can help protect your the your company's PII or your your customers' PII rather, so that only the folks who should be able to see it are able to see it but people are still able to do analysis. Simon can still do what it needs to do and, and users in Simon can see what they need to see, but you're not just sharing everybody's address and phone number and every, and email address, you know, just with, you know, with your entire company base. 
Yeah. Um, so things to do here, like obviously identify what, what whole data sets collect PII and then flag the, the data points as PII in your data warehouse. So like, again, to use Snowflake as an example, has a great tagging feature where you can tag individual columns, like just say, oh, this column is PII data. And then you can create policies around those tags so that you're not like kind of playing whack-a-mole of, okay, what tables and columns in my warehouse contain PII? And I have to go and manage each one individually. Yep, exactly. And, then, and I think the, the PII piece is interesting because depending on the deployment, it really, there's has to be some strategy here. For a connected deployment, the yeah. data never leaves your data warehouse. So security wise, it's wrapped into, if you're using Snowflake, all of so Snowflake security parameters. So you don't have to exactly. worry about data in transit until it's being activated. And you're going to only activate data that's designed for marketing personalization, right? You're not sending you know, social security numbers, things along those lines. So right. huge advantage of a connected deployment there is inherently the, the data in one place, not having to worry about, like you said, duplicating or managing it across multiple mm -hmm. applications. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, to make sure that happens, right, like create a data governance plan. If you want to go on to the next slide, please, Matt. Yeah. Um, yeah. So similar to how you have business discussions on what those data quality metrics are, you should be having business discussions you know, within your marketing team, with the folks who are maintaining your, your data warehouse on a framework to determine how data is accessed and controlled. Who really needs to see this data? How do they get access to it? You know, and, and use your cloud data warehouse and the tools it provides to, to control that. You know, don't get too cute with it. Don't say like, oh, well, Jane needs a special role because she needs to do this one little thing. And then, you know, and then Matt needs another special role just for him because he's going to do this thing over here. You use a combination of database roles to control data sets and then account roles that get tied to like teams or functions to make it very clear. Okay, the marketing team role has access to this customer role or this customer data, but they can only read it, you know, yeah. and so on and so forth, right? Yeah, exactly. But you have to have those business talks. Exactly. And most marketers don't need to look at an individual record. It's really dealing with groupings. Give me all the 40-year-old men. I don't need to read Matt O'Neill's individual contacts or data in his profile because essentially mm -hmm. I'm trying to build an audience, not do a one-to-one -one email to that individual person. Very different than right. the use case a customer service person would have um, or, or a, a salesperson would have. Yep, exactly. Cool. And so then, uh, yeah, I would just really quickly say, if you do all that, and then you do have to deal with like GDPR or other regulations that require like data deletion, you know, you know, and uh, forget me, all those kind of things. All this sets it up to be really easy. You will have a clean lineage. You can use those PII tags, et cetera, to very clearly see where are we storing this person's information. And then it could just be a very simple SQL script that gets run to delete that one individual's data. So it's a lot of work on on the front end, but saves you a lot of pain and potential legal activity on the back end. Yes, a, a lot. And and look, a lot of our customers are coming to us with how do we do consent management? How do we do preference management? How do I then do aggregations? Because a person can opt out of emails in four different places in our business. Like, how do I then consolidate that and manage that? And that is another challenge that we lean directly into. There's a lot of ways that we can do this. There's a lot of ways that we help customers do this. So, so if if there's folks on the on the call that are just like, yeah, our consent management is a gives me anxiety. 100%, James uh, and, and the Simon team, we certainly lean into that challenge because we have customers mm -hmm. across the spectrum um, that have you know in in the um, in in Europe in the United States. You know, the CCPA specifically in the United States can be a real challenge, right? If customers aren't aren't thinking mm -hmm. about it the right way. Um, and there's components of our platform that help with that. But also, like James mentioned, the strategy up front will save you a whole bunch of trouble um, downstream. Yep. Cool. 
Cool. So I think I think we have a few minutes left. Um, I'm seeing there's a few questions kind of popping up. So I'm certainly going to make sure that we have time to answer those questions. Um, I did want to just quickly pop open the platform because I think it makes sense to just quickly talk through some of the components of Simon. I'm going to go really kind of quickly here. I won't give a full end to end demo. Um, and, and then if there's any questions moving forward, you know, um, please, you know, fire off in the chat and we can answer them. So the, the first thing I just want to quickly talk about, essentially what James and I had discussed was building that single view of the customer. So think of Simon as ingesting data from multiple applications, whether that's fast moving event-based data or what I you know, classify as like more slow moving profile-based data, combining that into a single location for marketers to take action on. In this specific case, we're looking at an individual profile. And what I just want to call out here is some of the things that James had touched on was, you know, we can grab, you know, vanilla type values, age, birth date, preference information from your data warehouse, in this case, Snowflake, we can also provide some form of aggregations or machine learning to that data. What is someone's average order value? What is someone's churn likelihood, right? What is someone's category affinity? So point being is as your data lives in your Snowflake, in your data warehouse, wherever it might live, Simon can ingest that data or sit directly on top of your data warehouse and then make that data actionable for marketers. In this case, in a profile that's designed for each individual customer. Now, we also, like I said, marry that with more fast moving event based data. When did this person abandon the cart? What emails was this person in? What was their web activity or, or transaction activity? Point being is here is like an actual visualization for an individual around their profile with their events in a single place. This then serves as the foundation for essentially segmentation, automation, personalization moving forward. And really the, the first place that marketers start to get into um, a lot of the, the value of this is when building out audiences. So you can see in this case, a very basic audience, give me everyone that has a purchase propensity of over 50%, that has an affinity towards a certain category of our products, that has been on the website, in this case, in the last 30 days. So when you think logically, a lot of this data is stored very separately in a lot of ecosystems. There's data coming from a, from your uh, analytics tool. There's data coming from a machine learning based tool. There's profile information around category affinity. Like as a marketer without a tool like Simon, how are you going to build this audience? Right? You, it will require SQL. It will require a lot of you know data work to get here. Where in our case, that information is visualized directly in the platform for a marketer to make decisions on. Right? And not only can a marketer in this case you know make decisions on it, Simon's going to provide insights in real time. How big is the audience? What is their average? transaction value, right? Any sort of KPI that you think is important for essentially driving and building that audience. And the reason I had harped on the data elements up front is any data profile event or any profile attribute essentially becomes immediately available for marketers to make decisions on, right? Did they download the app? When were they last in the store? Are they part of our loyalty program, right? All of that is dependent on what information is in the data warehouse that we're ingesting, that James and team have normalized and structured for Simon to then act on. So I know this is kind of a, a crash course uh, demo of Simon. I just wanted to give a quick overview of like how the data comes into the platform and how in one simple use case, it can then be leveraged for building audiences. But this really gets into the, the, the components of how the platform can be leveraged. Cool. So just about five minutes left. Let me stop sharing my screen. Um, and it looks like in the chat, we have a handful of questions. Let me just take a look. Um, I'm not the best driver of these things. <laughs> so this might take me a second. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Perfect. So uh, question one are, are there any security implications we need to be aware of for a connected slash a composable deployment? And I would say certainly there are. I don't know, uh, James, if you want to take a swing at it first. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's always security implications. So again, a lot of what we were talking about before, ensuring that only the folks who should have access to the data have access to it, both at Simon, right? Like Simon has users and admins and things like that, but also at your data warehouse level. Um, and uh, I'm sure you can go into a lot more detail on like the you know, specifically CDP and, and security. Yeah, exactly. I, I think th this is a loaded question. I hate to always kind of, um, you know, pass by security questions because the security folks are the most detailed folks you'll ever talk to. Um, and they don't Very love true. talking to folks like me <laughs> in a lot of cases. But 
a lot of with the connected environment, the security is wrapped around the security that's inherently part of your data warehouse, right? Yep. And the whole mm -hmm. goal of that is less movement of data means more security, right? And you, your FinTech, your HLS, right? Those are the folks that are saying, hey, we built the data warehouse. We want to put folks to action on it. And we want as little movement of our data as possible outside of engagement. So I would say for folks that are that are highly worried about security, a connected deployment is certainly a conversation to, to, to be had. Um, a second question we got, well, this is a good one. So what sort of engineering support is required for a connected deployment? Um, and so I'll go first, James, and then and you can add some some context here. I think right. the deployment of the, of, the, of the Simon tool itself is, is actually not that complicated of a process. The, the actual engineering support required is to make sure that your data in the data warehouse is in a mature enough state that it can be leveraged. I think to, you know, James made a point earlier, you might have eight or nine user tables or user centric tables in your data warehouse currently to get full advantage of a true connected deployment. You'd like to have some of that consolidated. So it's less confusing for a marketer to have to navigate or learn your table structures and your field names essentially. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I think the level of effort, yeah. Classic engineer answers, it depends, right? Um, it'll depend on, you know, which of those different components of the data stack have, does your company already have stood up or do you need to stand like the full stack up net new? And then how many of the different marketing platforms data do we need to ingest and, and do that transformation and consolidation on, right? So there's a few variables at hand there. It's all totally doable, you know, um, but like the the level of effort is going to be kind of dependent on on all of that. But um, you know, typically we're not talking about like several months or like a year, right? Like it, it's usually like in the weeks to like a few short months time frame to stand up something solid enough to put Simon on top of and and immediately see some value. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, we especially with a connected deployment. If you have a users table, a, a, a an events table. We can hook that up and have things happening. You know, you can measure that in days in a lot of cases. If, yeah, if that, yeah, yeah, and that you could do days totally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and so the what slows you down is usually content. What slows you down is consolidation of your own data. But in terms of like, hey, if you're in a mature spot, one hundred percent, you know, this can be measured in in short time frames. We're not looking at yeah. you know a six month you know Salesforce full deployment, which can be a real challenge. It's a it's, it's a very different thing. Um, than I think a lot of folks are used to. And I think, you know, we're about two minutes left. Um, one more question, how does reporting work? I think this is a very loaded question. So uh, I'll go kind of quickly, but the goal with Simon specifically is to leverage your data warehouse and also share data back into your data warehouse. So in that case, generally speaking, Simon is taking information, normalizing that, providing audiences, enriching that with engagement data, and then you're using your data warehouse, let's say Snowflake as an example, as the engine to feed your tableaus, your lookers, your power BIs of the world. So think of Simon essentially as like marketing interface for driving engagement and also providing enriched data sets into your data warehouse for overall analytics and, and reporting dashboards. Yep. Yeah. Because again, you don't want three different tools for reporting and dashboards because then nobody knows where the, where to go for accurate reports, right? Simon's yep. going to be a key component for all the engagement audience definition, but those audience definitions get written right back into the warehouse for then, like you said, like a tableau to get uh, to to pull in. So again, you're getting like the one source of truth. Yep, exactly right. Well, we're up against the clock, James. I want to truly thank you um, for, for joining us. Great content today. Um, if yeah, there thanks are for having me. Yeah, if there's any further questions, please, please, please reach out to either one, uh, either one of us on LinkedIn. Um, happy to keep the conversation going. But um, for everyone that attended, I, I truly appreciate it. And hopefully we'll be talking to you guys again soon. Yes. Yep. Have a great day, everyone.